In part two, we'll be looking at several other features that relates to account management and sub-accounts. Um, within the context of account management, we're going to look at user management and user invitations and what that looks like. We'll talk a little bit about divisions and guest access and what that looks like. We'll also talk about some of the audit logs and the activities. And then of course, we'll also be reviewing sub-accounts, which, um, which is quite a big part of, of Cert Central's decentralized certificate management process. So now we're going to take a look at accounts and let's go ahead and start with uh, users. So understanding users in Cert Central is really important because it affects everything that any user is able to do because of the fact that different user types have different um, privilege levels. And you might see the phrase, or you might have heard of the phrase role-based access control before um, in um, terminology within the cybersecurity industry. And this is a very famous or popular uh, kind of um, concept that relates to the fact that you, you have different, um, different roles uh, of a user that you can use to access only that which they need to. So if we start, for instance, with the administrator, the administrator is someone who can invite other users, create sub-accounts, create divisions. They can place orders, change settings. They can basically do everything. So um, people typically wouldn't create a larger number of administrators within the account. Um, but if it was an account where there was a lot of users, they would separate that out by function. And so typically what you would see is the administrator role and uh, maybe some combination of manager and standard user. The finance manager role is somewhat similar to the standard user role in that they can also place orders, but they always need to be approved by a manager or an administrator. And the same is true for the standard user. They can place orders, but they have to be approved. Um, <clears throat> so the one difference is that with a standard user, you can actually have this additional option to limit them to being able to place their own orders. And in doing so, the standard user then becomes known as a limited user. And this is important if you have many different people in an account and you only want those people that are requesting orders for themselves to see their own orders. Otherwise they would see the orders that do not belong to them. The manager role is useful because the manager can actually go ahead and approve um, certificate requests and they can also add domains and organizations and they can edit users and they can edit divisions, but they cannot create divisions and they cannot um, invite new users. So that is an important distinction between a manager and administrator. So in this case, the workflow would be that I'm adding, a, like as, as an administrator, I'm adding a cert central user to the account. Um, if, you know, once filling out this information, once I click add user, they will receive an email um, and, you know, at, at which point they'll have to create a, a password. And once they create their password, they'll be allowed to uh, log into cert central and they'll have full access. So typically we would see if you wanted to and type out kind of all the information, would ask for the email address. You'll see that what happens here under username. So the username is typically the email address. Now it doesn't have to be. So the username can be anything else, but it is, it is copied from this email address uh, field. Also an important thing to note is that no two Cert Central accounts can have the same username, but any number of Cert Central accounts Kind of the same email address. So really the email address doesn't matter, it's about the username. You can also force this user to only being able to log in through the SAML single sign-on feature. And what this means is, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but the SAML single sign-on allows someone to log in and authenticate to Cert Central through a separate system known as an identity provider. And that basically means that the user wouldn't see the Cert Central login page. They would log in through this other you know, internal uh, system that they use. 
and uh, that's what they would use to authenticate to Cert Central. As part of that security process, you might want to say, okay, in addition to adding this user, I actually also want this user to not be able to log directly into Cert Central, but they must only be able to log in through our company's internal identity provider. So that's what the system is, but uh, we'll expand on that a little bit later. And then of course, you can also restrict this user to specific divisions. We'll talk a little bit about divisions in a moment, but the point is that they can um, belong to multiple different divisions, but when you do this, it means that, um, that automatically they are unable to access any other division. And this is relevant because for example, all orders belong to a division. So if they are um, restricted to a division that they do not have, a, 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 if they're restricted to one division and there are orders that belong to a different division, they won't see those orders. So the way that this is configured uh, for a particular customer is very important. And it depends on the requirements and what it is that they're looking to achieve by restricting users to divisions. So we see also, uh, if we go ahead and we actually uh, look at um, the, the divisions themselves. So here you can see there's a long sort of list of different divisions that in this account we have created over time. There's no limit to the number of divisions so that so you can create any. Um, I will just mention something important here in the UI, which is that as you can see, there is this uh, sort of arrow that then drops up the different divisions um, underneath the uh, parent division. And it's important to note that these are not, these are not subdivisions in the sense that uh, they're like sub accounts where they have their own um, sort of management capability. These are, these, this division is as different from this division and <clears throat> they are, they are all sort of unique buckets, if you will. So you might think of these as child containers, uh, 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 child divisions of the DigiCert Enterprise Sales Engineering uh, Division, which in this case is the main one. Um, <clears throat> but, but they are all separate and th there, is no, there isn't a way for you to create a second parent division. So that is something that's important. So you'll see when you create a division, you can go ahead and configure certain uh, options. So the reason why people would create uh, divisions is because um, you can restrict divisions to particular organizations. So if I, for instance, went and I restricted this organization to this particular, uh, this division to this organization, it means that they would not be able to place an order for any other organization other than the one that's restricted here. And the same is true for domains. So if, <clears throat> for instance, the minute that I wrote a particular domain name here, it means that everything else is not allowed except for what's specified here. Um, the platform will also um, respect subdomains. So if, for example, you wanted to add, um, you know, like, any subdomain as a, as a minimum criteria uh, is basically anything here, um, then someone would be able to add that and then they would always have to include that as uh, a prefix in terms of when they're trying to place an order. So for example, if I said um, test.people.co.z, it means that when someone places a request for an order, this will be treated as the base domain. So they would have to either order it for just that domain or include something like www.test.people.co.za. So this is essentially what the, the function of divisions are. Um, we, we won't talk about this in as much detail, but under the finances section, there's also a way to move funds between divisions because when people place orders, then um, if you have funds that are assigned to a particular division, um, then each division essentially will have its own budget in that sense. So just to kind of show you again, when I'm placing an order, what that looks like is there is always a requirement for that order to be associated with a division. So 
Um, in, in our part one, we didn't discuss this in too much detail, but you can see now that uh, during, on the request page, this is the relevance of this list here. And so if you go to any order, you will always be able to see that um, an order <clears throat> belongs to a division. So if we'll just go to this order that I just placed um, earlier, you'll see that it says here the division is this, <clears throat> but you can always go and change that to uh, a different a division entirely. There is no restrictions on that. <clears throat> okay. So now let's go ahead and take a look at guest access. So guest access is a very useful tool that allows someone to access Cert Central without having to be a user within Cert Central. This is a critical distinction because <clears throat> you will allow any user with a particular URL that we're going to create now be able to place orders that an administrator will have to approve. So let's go ahead and, and start by going through this process. So let's say that <clears throat> I wanted to create a guest URL. So you would type the name, which typically would uh, um, reference its purpose. <clears throat> and then you would choose a division. And again, this is important because the division might have um, specific restrictions on it. And if this was, let's say, a guest URL, uh, meaning a URL that anyone can use to place orders, you could restrict the um, criteria that the guest URL is uh, eligible for by using a division that you've already manipulated to only allow for particular domain names. Then you can also choose what product should be available um, for this. So in this case, uh, you know, let's say we go ahead and choose a secure site OV only. Um, you know, I can maybe choose this as the default product. If you want to choose more than one, I'll just choose a one year period here. And then there's additional options that you can choose depending on what the purpose of the guest URL will be. So um, if you wanted to hide existing validated domains in the account, if you wanted to hide any DCB methods because you may want to only have pre-validated domains in the account. You could hide contacts that you, you don't want anyone um, outside of Cert Central to see the contacts associated with your organization. And then of course you can choose whether you want them to only to be able to select from existing organizations or if they should be able to create new ones. So typically these are the kind of options that you would fill in and then you would create the guest URL. Now the guest URL lives on indefinitely. So there is no particular restriction. So you can delete that if you wanted to, but the core is that you would take this uh, guest URL, this link over here, and you would copy and paste that into your browser. It's important to note that you're not able to um, do this in the same browser. So if you are busy, getting ready for your exam and your testing, be sure to open up two different browsers because otherwise Cert Central cannot make a distinction between the authentication of the URL. So in this case, we're just going ahead and we're gonna choose the product um, that we configured for this guest URL. And you can see here that um, we now have a page that's similar to the Cert Central uh, order page, except in this case, um, I'm not actually logged into Cert Central at all. So we see here, I'm just going to add my details as part of the certificate request. And uh, let me just go ahead and grab a CSR. And you can see as in Cert Central, it's now also populated um, the organization name as, as well as the common name. We see that there is no other information about contacts or anything of that nature. There's still the custom fields, which I mentioned earlier on that I will talk about later. So we'll just leave those blank for now. And I would go ahead and just say, uh, I agree to the master services agreement and submit the request. So you can see here that it says, your request has been created and is now pending approval by an administrator. So if we go ahead and we tab back into Cert Central, if we go under the requests tab over here, because remember, this is about an approval workflow. 
anyone that orders a certificate outside of Cert Central needs review. And so when we look at the requests point, uh, the requests page, we'll um, be able to see that this particular request actually came through from the guest URL. Now it says requested by Christian de Villiers, but this is because that is the name that I wrote when I made this request um, through the guest URL. And so you'll see as an administrator, there's actually a message that we show here, which is like, you know, hey, this request was submitted through the guest URL, not an authenticated user. So then the, the onus is then on the administrator to choose to approve or reject that particular certificate request. So in this case, I've gone ahead and approved that. So now that certificate should issue and that should be fine. You can see there it says approved. Now, the next part is we're gonna be taking a look again at guest access, although in this case, looking at placing new orders, but we're gonna be looking at managing um, renewals and existing issued certificates. So you'll see in this case, we're always creating a new URL. It's a new configuration. Each one is designed to a division and it uh, sort of sits in isolation. But what about those orders that have already been requested through the guest URL as an example? And so the answer to that is quite easy, fortunately, which is that you're able to access all of that account information by using this guest access link. And this link is a static link. So it is not something that is um, the same. It's unique to every single account. So if we dig a bit deeper here and uh, we go ahead and, and look at this page, you'll see that the page here is really, what we want here is an email address to authenticate, um, you know, the uh, person who's previously um, ordered the certificate. And the email address here that we're looking for is really anyone that's listed under the additional emails field within Cert Central. So if we go here, you'll see you can choose these various options, which is that, well, do we accept the organization contact? Do we accept the technical? Do we, ex um, do we accept the person that originally requested the certificate? And as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of different options on how you can manipulate that. But this essentially allows you to choose who will be able to modify and interact with this order. So in this case, let's just say that I go ahead and I'm going to choose this common name that I've placed orders for. And now it's going to require an authentication code. So once I receive this code, I'll be able to um, enter that over here and then proceed online. So let me find that code quickly and then we can uh, move ahead. And here we go. So now we see this is a list of all of those orders with this common name uh, where my email has also been uh, included. And there's various orders. Some of them uh, are different products. It's not just the same of which I ordered. And you can see all this information is here about the validities and whether the orders are expiring or not. And in this case, <clears throat> we see that there's a certificate expiring in May. So if I wanted to, uh, for instance, interact with a particular order, I would just click on it. And then I could um, initiate a renewal if I wanted to, as an example. So if we go look at this one, let's say this uh, over here, the 8th of June. So in this case, if I wanted to renew the certificate, that would be perfectly acceptable. And you can see that the form looks very um, similar to what we did for the guest URL um, in that you just provide the same information and this will then work um, as the renewal. So then we'll just quickly go back to um, Cert Central. So the um, guest access is quite an important feature. Uh, the audit logs feature, this is also critical for um, in particular enterprise customers. You can see there's a lot of information that we track, um, you know, from being able to change settings in the account, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later on, um, all the way to approving requests. As an example here, you can see that this is my Cert Central user um, username, uh, or a user um, first name and last name, and the action and, and what, what I did as well as my IP address. And then lastly, we'll just quickly talk about uh, user invitations, and then we'll just move on to sub accounts. 
So user invitations here is just essentially you can see who the invite um, who the invitation was sent to, the status. So in in, in this case, um, these two individuals have completed the the, um, the 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 email and now it needs administrator approval. So I can go ahead and I can choose now to approve them and I can choose what role they need to have. So in this case, maybe I'll just go ahead and choose a manager role and I'll click approve. Now moving on to sub accounts. So sub accounts is a great way for enterprise customers to manage decentralized business units, but it's also a really great way for partners to allow them to either resell Cert Central or perhaps create um, accounts for sub resellers of their own. And as you can see, this page provides an overview of all of the um, different sub accounts that exist uh, within this uh, the Cert Central account. So that means that this account would be known as the parent account. And you can see the sub account type here, retail, enterprise, and reseller. So if we wanted to create a sub account, then you'll see that the first option that you can do is to choose the sub account type. And this essentially uh, will determine the level of options and functionality that is included in the sub account itself. So, um, without going into too much detail, it's fairly straightforward. There's a sub account contact who is the person that will receive the username and the password and essentially be the first user within uh, that sub account. Um, you can also add the organization details, which is effectively the organization that is tied to that sub account. Um, you can also choose who will be billed for these certificate orders. And this is really important because um, if you choose the bill sub account uh, option, it means that any orders that the sub account places will be billed directly to that sub account. In other words, they'll be responsible for their own uh, account or bill. Um, however, if you choose this option, bill win the customer, win the customer is the name of the organization within this account that I've been issuing um, certificates from. So this is saying, bill the parent account, which is this account that I'm using right now. In other words, the sub account that I'm in the process of creating, if I choose this option, this means that they all of their orders will essentially be billed to my account and they will be able to place their own orders. Typically in the reseller scenario, that means that the a sub account, um, the orders that they place, it means that the parent account is invoicing the um, their own customer separately. And this option just means, this option will just determine whether or not the sub account itself will have to pay for the orders placed to the, um, the, the sub sub account, or if they must be billed to the parent account. You can also choose sub account spending limits. So uh, perhaps, you know, if this was a partner or an enterprise, and there was no budget, they could say basically unlimited, you know, you can request as many certificates as you'd like, I will invoice you separately or, uh, you know, whatever that conversation may look like, or it's, you know, it's limited because you've given me X amount of funds and I'm going to create a budget for you. You can also create a, uh, a, a currency here. Note that this is a vanity um, uh, configuration, meaning this has no bearing on uh, how they will be billed. So for example, we will, you know, if, if you choose, for example, Swiss franc, it just means that we will show the appropriate value of the pricing uh, appended with that currency. You can also choose the default pricing, or you can customize the pricing that the sub account can see. So that means you might want to uh, increase or decrease or change whatever the default prices are for these products. And of course, you can also um, configure the maximum multi-year length. Uh, perhaps you only want your um, the sub account users to be able to order one year um, certificates uh, to avoid um, long transaction spans, or perhaps you know the flexibility of six years is convenient, in which case you can leave it at that point. And lastly, um, once you've configured all of these options, 
and uh, maybe deselected products that you feel do not apply to this particular sub account, you can just go ahead and click save. And then it means that that sub account will effectively have been created. It will still be in a dormant state until the sub account contact has actioned the credentials. Um, lastly, we can see that uh, there's also the orders uh, tab over here. And the orders tab lists all of the orders across uh, any order whereby the parent has been billed. So that could be the uh, sub account or the sub sub account, and it's all listed over here. You could, uh, of course, filter by uh, you know, various criteria to find more detail about what you're looking for, uh, but effectively this page shows all of that. Um, you can also create sub accounts that use units instead of any currency at all. Um, and if you wish to do that, you can actually choose uh, the unit option. Um, although the, the unit option typically applies more for um, the, the um, sub account itself. And so that concludes part two. And just in summary, um, in this section, we covered um, the account settings in, uh, in your accounts that meant we spoke through users, divisions, guest access, audit logs, user invitations, and we spoke about sub accounts, the different types of sub accounts. We spoke about the orders, the filters that you can use, and uh, then also the um, unit orders. And the unit orders are those orders that have been uh, assigned to different sub accounts, whereby they're not using an account balance, but they're rather using a unit balance.